Well, welcome everyone. My name is Alana Gensler and I'm so happy that you're joining us for a very special presentation. I just wanted to go over a few quick housekeeping items. This presentation is recorded and we'll be uh, making it accessible in a few business days. Um, live transcription is available during this event and you can edit your settings in the lower right hand button if you wish to see them or turn them off. Um, and then I ask that you please remain muted throughout the duration of the presentation. When we have our Q&A session at the end, I will call out your questions to Professor Ehrman. But Joe, I will now turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. You know, over the years, I found that the task of the Supreme Court uh, it's much more complicated than I first thought. And there's been three tasks they do that have always interested me. One task that I've always found interesting is determining the meaning of the Constitution itself. And the intent of a passage written 250 years ago during different social and technological times, as well as using then current linguistic meanings and conventions sometimes makes it hard to grasp, <clears throat> excuse me, grasp the original intent or at least implied nuances. Further, I've always found it interesting how they decide if the relevant passages should be taken literally or figuratively, or how somehow they can be adjusted to reflect changing times. And lastly, of course, realistically, how politics and popular opinion might be factored into their decisions. Fortunately, our speaker today, Professor Daniel Ehrman, will discuss these and other Supreme Court tasks in the context of how they might rule on some currently pending cases. He has a law degree from Harvard Law School, a master's degree in politics and international relations from Oxford University, where he was a Marshall Scholar, and an undergraduate degree in history and political science from the University of California, Los Angeles. He's been here at Northeastern since 2009 and is currently an assistant teaching professor, as well as the director of the Doctorate in Law and Policy program. In this capacity, he's developed and taught undergraduate and graduate courses in the areas of political science and law and public policy. He's worked on several political campaigns, including the last four Democratic National Conventions. He's held positions in a variety of large law firms and has been a assistant district attorney for Suffolk County here in Massachusetts. So warm, Northeastern at noon, welcome to Professor Ehrman. And I now turn the meeting over to him. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I, I, I was gonna, I think you could, you could run this as well as I do. Those were some very uh, interesting remarks framing it. I was scribbling it down. Um, interpreting the constitution literally versus figuratively is actually uh, in an issue that has come up a couple times in recent years. So hopefully during the Q&A, we can cover that. Um, it's really nice to see everyone here. There are even a few of my former undergraduate students here. Um, most of them have not yet applied to law school. So they are hoping that this will get them brownie points for a letter of recommendation that I write them. So um, if you could just help me, if you see any of the younger faces, if they're rolling their eyes or anything, just send me a private note and I will take that into account uh, when considering whether or not to support them. Um, and the, a few of them, yeah, have written me notes like, oh, I can only make it, you know, to part of it. I got other things. And I just wrote back to them and I said, you know, life is about priorities uh, and it's important uh, to, to, to just not just show up, but also stay. So no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. So it's nice to reach um, such a large audience. And I do wanna leave uh, plenty of time 
uh, at the end for Q and A, Joe and I, before it started, were chatting about a a recent uh, article in the Wall Street Journal uh, about masks and about liberty and about the First Amendment. Um, the basic overall argument that I'm going to make today is that you you really can't disentangle the Supreme Court from politics, uh, and unfortunately, the court has both reflected and accelerated some of our national trends in polarization, okay? So you can't take the court out of politics, but the court is both a reflection and an accelerator of the political stalemate uh, in which we find ourselves. So what I'm gonna do, I don't love PowerPoints, but because I'm not there live and can only bring so much Zoom energy. Um, I think it's nice to have some slides and photos that will be framing the issue. Uh, so there are going to be some photos and it will also help discipline me and to keep this talk closer to 35, 40 minutes as opposed to four or five hours. Uh, I'm actually free till about five, but I think some of you probably have lives. Uh, and my former students certainly did not sign up for, for such a long afternoon. So let, let me get started. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and just give everyone, including the sort of non-court watchers, non-court junkies, an overview. Okay, so let's make sure just, um, Joe, can you give a thumbs up? Can you see a picture of the court? Great. Okay. Okay. Just want, thank you, Joe. Just you're, you're you're like my pace car. I just want to I want to make sure. Um, and and again, now that I can only see Joe, for my former students who are uh, lurking and sort of hiding, uh, you should know better. Okay. All right. So the title is "A Court at the Crossroads: The U.S. Supreme Court in a Polarized Country." I am Dan Ehrman. Um, all right. Now, when I say court in a polarized country, I really want to start with August of 2010. Why do I want to start in August of 2010? Because this was the first time in recorded history that the political party nominating the justice was a close to perfect fit of the ideology of the justice. So just to repeat, starting with Elena Kagan's confirmation, for the first time ever, you could use a shorthand and say the Democratic appointed justices and the Republican appointed justices. Why could you not before? Because you had John Paul Stevens, who was a Gerald Ford nominee, and you had David Souter, who was a George Bush senior nominee. In other words, those were more liberal justices appointed by Republican presidents. So what, I, what I'm saying is that August of 2010 really did mark a new era for the Supreme Court because, and I'm just going to do a quick, uh, quick uh I guess, description or naming of the justices from, uh, from front to back, left to right. And by the way, that is not ideological because Clarence Thomas in, in no world is a left-leaning justice, uh, maybe stage right. Um, but I'm gonna go over them. And I just wanna say that since August of 2010, you can say Republican justices and Democratic justices, and that's a, a fairly good fit. All right. Starting in the front row on <laughs> audience left or stage left, you have Clarence Thomas, next to him Antonin Scalia, then Chief Justice John Roberts, Chief Justice Anthony Kennedy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and then in the second row from left to right, Sonia Sotomayor, Stephen Breyer, who is getting a lot of pressure to retire. People are writing it on his Starbucks cup or his Dunkin' Donuts cup. Uh, we'll talk about that later if you want during the Q&A. 
Samuel Alito, and Elena Kagan. So again, this six-year period was pretty stable. People called it the Kennedy Court because Kennedy there in the front um, on the right was usually the decisive vote. This is the, the court that decided Obergefell versus Hodges, which said that there's a national right of same-sex couples to get married. Right, that was a that was a big case. This is the same court that upheld the Affordable Care Act twice. First in June of 2012 in NFIB versus Sebelius, and then again in June of 2015 in a case called King v. Burwell. Okay, this is the Roberts Court from February of 2016 to April of 2017. For those of you wondering what happened, and of course, if we were live, I would do some crowd and I would ask you what happened. Some of you would say, that's when Obama killed Scalia. And I would say, okay, that's you're sort of there. Others would say that's when Scalia was found at a ranch in Texas. I would say that's probably a better way to put it. Antonin Scalia died suddenly in February of 2016, which put the Supreme Court on the ballot. And as many of you recall, Mitch McConnell quickly decided that he would not hold a hearing for President Barack Obama's Merrick Garland, and they would hold the seat open, basically put the election on the ballot. I would argue that if you look at the exit polls, where about a quarter of the voters in 2016 said that the Supreme Court was very important to them, and that by a six to four ratio, those voters supported Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton, I think you can make a pretty solid argument that Scalia's death contributed directly to Donald Trump's electoral college victory. I think, I think you can make the case and I think the numbers support it. Well, between February of 2016 and April of 2017, the court was quote unquote, evenly divided. It was quote unquote, deadlocked. And that meant that we didn't hear too much from the court. The only two decisions that came down in this period that were pretty notable uh, were one decision called Whole Women's Health, which upheld the core right in Roe v. Wade for uh, women to terminate their pregnancies. And in a case called Fisher v. Texas, there was a case that upheld the University of Texas's affirmative action plan, which took race into account for some undergraduate class at the University of Texas. So those were those were two cases, but the only ways they could be decided would be 5-3 by definition because of the eight-member court. Okay, picture day again. We have a new justice, and they always they sit in the order of seniority, not ideology. So what has changed? Well, the justices have shifted, but in the top right you have Neil Gorsuch, who was President Trump's success nominee to be on the Supreme Court and the replacement for Justice Scalia, okay? This is another period here. You, you, you can tell that some of them look increasingly uncomfortable during picture day, or maybe they just caught them at a bad moment, but <laughs> this is the Roberts Court from 2018 to 2020. What has changed here? Anthony Kennedy, the longtime swing justice, especially on issues affecting uh, LGBT rights, he retired and his former clerk, Brett Kavanaugh, there in the upper right, replaced him in some very contentious hearings that we probably all remember. 
This meant that Chief Justice John Roberts, right there, front middle, he hasn't moved in these photos because he's the Chief Justice. Roberts was now the Chief Justice and the swing vote, meaning he was the tiebreaker. He was Kennedy. And Roberts used this position pretty carefully. And he staked out a fairly moderate path. I would say center right, but certainly not as right wing as he might have been if he were an associate justice because Roberts cares a lot about the court and its credibility. So in issues affecting abortion rights and uh, a the cancellation of DACA, uh, the deferred action for childhood arrivals by President Trump, uh, Roberts really staked out a pretty moderate path. And people were saying, wow, you know, you know, who would have thought it? Roberts as the new Kennedy. But this pretty much held, and again, in 2020, Roberts upheld uh, basically the, the Roe v. Wade and Casey work that America was used to from 1973 onwards and said the court has to uphold opinions even if the personnel changes. So he was saying it's really important for the court to stand by its decisions. This is stare decisis if you're watching Jeopardy or if you tell party. But basically Robert said, we can't just have cases get overruled when new members join the court. Okay. Then, as we know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away in September of 2020 and was replaced here on the uh, upper right by Amy Coney Barrett. What does that mean? It means that Chief Justice John Roberts is no longer the swing. He is the fourth most liberal justice. And it means that Brett Kavanaugh up there on the top row on the left is the swing justice. So that's why you see media references to the new 6-3 conservative majority because the liberals or what I call moderate liberals are Elena Kagan, Stephen Breyer, and Sonia Sotomayor, and the other six can fairly be called conservative justices. Okay, so that's where we are. So this Supreme Court, both very diverse and lacking diversity, all right? So seven of the justices were raised Catholic. Gorsuch was raised Catholic uh, and then uh, is now an Episcopalian. Right, there are two Jews on the court. Uh, we have the second um, African justice, first Latina justice, and we have three female justices, which is the highest number of female justices ever on the court. They lack diversity in terms of education. There are four graduates from Yale Law School, four from Harvard Law School, and then you have one Notre Dame Law School graduate in Amy Coney Barrett. Professionally, most of them were law professors or circuit judges. Why were they circuit judges? Because when someone is already a judge, it's very easy to carefully study them and their ideology. How do they rule when a case is unclear and they have two lines of precedent from which to pick, All right? You can study them and big data makes this even easier. Someone like David Souter, who was a state court judge and then only very briefly on the first circuit here in Boston, seemed to send the message that if you haven't looked carefully on someone's record on federal law, you might make a mistake. Hence the rallying cry, no more suitors, right? And then in terms of fancy, 
On the current court, you have six justices who themselves clerked for the Supreme Court, which is the high watermark for a lawyer. There are only about 36 of them per year. You can see below Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch clerked the same year for Anthony Kennedy. They also went to high school together. So if you want to get back to a lack of diversity, how about some more high schools represented, right? Um, I, I like to joke that this is the first, remember when Obama wore a tan suit and there was a lot of controversy? This is what I call the first tan suit controversy. That is a terrible choice by Brett Kavanaugh there, right in the middle. And then the other person is just blazer and slacks. I mean, come on, wear a suit. Okay, that's just, just an observation. Uh, and it hasn't gotten enough attention. All right, big picture. The big picture trend is that Republican presidents for both random and non-random reasons have had 16 of the last 20 confirmed justices. So just to repeat, 80% of the last 20 justices have been Republican appointees, right? So just to quickly, it's kind of like a board, if you will. So just to quickly run through this, Richard Nixon really transformed the court. He ran against the Supreme Court, right? He called for law and order. He spoke out against the perceived excesses of Earl Warren and the Warren Court. He appointed Warren Berger to replace Earl Warren. He appointed Harry Blackman after the failed nominations of Hainsworth and Carswell, Lewis Powell, and William Rehnquist. Then Ford, at the advice of his attorney general, Ed Levy, appointed John Paul Stevens. This was in the wake of Watergate and Stevens had a reputation for great integrity. What happened to Jimmy Carter? Well, we, we just saw that recent photo where he appears to have been shrunk by the photographer uh, and Joe Biden was made into a giant. <laughs> but before that, he was not able to nominate a single justice on the Supreme Court. Why? Because no one retired, no one passed away, no one got impeached and removed. The only way that you leave the Supreme Court is voluntarily retiring, being impeached and removed, um, or passing away in office. Reagan, like Nixon, had a huge impact on the Supreme Court. He promised in 1980, when his pollsters told him there was a huge gender gap. What's the gender gap? Women liked Carter a lot more than Reagan. So what did Reagan say? I promise I will nominate a female Supreme Court justice when there is a vacancy. If that sounds familiar, it's because Biden in March of 2020 said the same thing and he added African-American, right? So right, history rhymes and echoes. So Reagan nominated Sandra Day O'Connor in 1981. Uh, then he nominated a court of appeals judge named Antonin Scalia, who was confirmed 98 to nothing, and I believe was the last nominee to smoke a pipe during the confirmation hearing. You can look it up. <laughs> William Rehnquist was promoted to chief justice. And then, this is a real turning point, Robert Bork gets voted down 58 to 42 by the U.S. Senate, including six Republicans. The term Bork or Borking enters our vocabulary, and he is replaced initially by another law professor and D.C. Circuit Judge Douglas Ginsburg. Nina Totenberg of NPR reports that Ginsburg used to smoke pot with students, which used to be a bad thing, apparently, especially in 1987. And then they find easily confirmable Anthony Kennedy, who was confirmed unanimously in early 1988. 
George Bush Sr., his first appointment in 1990, was David Souter, uh, as mentioned before. And then in 1991, Clarence Thomas, uh, before the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, those were the most contentious that America had ever seen. Bill Clinton, as you can see here, served two terms just like Ronald Reagan, but Clinton only got two Supreme Court nominations. Just again, luck of the draw. He appointed Ruth Bader Ginsburg for the first seat, uh, and then the second seat he nominated and got Stephen Breyer. So he got these nominations in 1993 and 1994, and then no more. George Bush Sr. also served two terms like Clinton, but only had two nominees. He nominated John Roberts to be Chief Justice. For those of you who remember, initially Roberts was going to replace O'Connor and then Rehnquist passed away. So Roberts resubmitted the application and uh, or Bush resubmitted the application, made Roberts the chief. Harriet Myers was briefly appointed to replace O'Connor, uh, but her nomination got pulled partially because of the same concerns about David Souter. She wasn't vetted. She wasn't a prior judge. And then Samuel Alito got appointed and confirmed. Barack Obama took office in 2009. His first pick to replace Souter was Sonia Sotomayor, and his second pick to replace Stevens was Elena Kagan. And then I put it in italics because nominated Merrick Garland but Garland did not get a hearing. So here we are now. Trump ran largely uh, promising to nominate justices who would overturn Roe v. Wade, who would expand the Second Amendment. And Trump in one term got three justices. So if you look at this uneven allocation of justices, you can probably see some of the fruits of the argument about reforming the Supreme Court appointment process, right? It, it, do we want to regularize it? Do we want to normalize it? Should election have more specific consequences, right? Did people know they were voting for Trump and three justices? Did people know they were voting for Carter and zero justices? So some arguments have been that justices should have a single 18-year term and that every presidential term gets an appointment during, during the first and third year of the presidency. So there's just sort of an automatic way of allocating justices and presidential elections. Something to consider. Okay. So these are quick overviews, and I'm happy. Um, my email is d.urman at Northeastern. If I'm sprinting through these too quickly, um, I'm happy to share these slides with you, and you can actually find most of these through Professor Google. Uh, but this is an overview. This is Chief Justice Roberts. He had and, and has an, an impeccable resume, almost like he was, you know, designed or, or built to be a Supreme Court justice. He was a, in a very, he was a very effective advocate in front of the Supreme Court. And he is conservative, especially when it comes to voting rights and the government taking account of race, right? One of his most famous opinions is the one that I quoted, the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. So when it comes to voting rights and affirmative action plans, he has generally voted to strike down government attempts to take race into account. Uh, most studies have shown, though, that in the last few years, as the court has gotten more conservative, he has gotten more liberal in his rulings. Okay, this is Associate Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, he has views that were often confused with Antonin Scalia because they're both originalists and textualists. That means that they 
look at the content and say, what did it mean at the time? The difference between Thomas and Scalia is that Thomas holds precedent in a much lower regard. His basic view is that if the court got something wrong, or if the court has ruled in a non-original then it's his job as a judge and a justice to make it right. And he cares less about precedent and stare decisis in that regard. In fact, when he was asked about stare decisis, he used to say, look, I'm an originalist, but I'm not a nut. And he was sort of like pointing at Thomas as the nut. Uh, Scalia say, I totally accept stare decisis as a pragmatic exception to originalism, meaning sometimes if things have been the law for over 100 years, I'm okay keeping them that way, even if I disagree with them, okay? Stephen Breyer, right, people, I mean, I'm not joking when I say there are literally digital billboards driving around DC saying, please retire. I don't know if people are finding out where he rides his bike or where he goes jogging and they're holding it in front of him, but I, I think he gets it. Uh, people are begging him to retire, uh, and uh, Justice uh, Breyer has been on the court uh, the second longest, right? Thomas is 91, Breyer is 94. He has a fancy background, and he thinks the government should be able to take race into account, and his rulings are, are much more... Uh, what are known as pragmatic, meaning he looks at the practical effects of the rulings. Sam Alito, remember um, initially this seat, this is replacing O'Connor, was supposed to go to Harriet Myers um, before the Ginsburg-Barrett switch. This was the most important replacement, meaning that Alito was considerably more uh, conservative then O'Connor on lots of big issues, including abortion and the use of race. Um, and um, Alito has had his views that seem to, to be in the minority in dissents have become increasingly part of the majority in the last five years or so. Sonia Sotomayor, again, Obama's first pick in 2009, she has emerged as the most liberal member of the Supreme Court, now in that group of three, uh, where Breyer and Kagan are more moderate, more willing to compromise, Sotomayor, especially on issues of uh, criminal justice and race, she has been more progressive. This is Associate Justice Elena Kagan. Uh, her resume is quite similar to that of Chief Justice Roberts, which is why I like to call them frenemies. They like each other, but also sort of don't like each other, which is the definition of a And she uh, has been known as the sort of liberal Scalia in that she writes very witty, biting opinions that law professors and law nerds like us enjoy reading. This is just my moment. Usually I play, I play some sad music. This is just to say, this is Merrick Garland. Um, he was supposed to be on the Supreme Court, but you know what? He's the Attorney General of the United States, so things are working out for him. It's just our little moment and put some acoustic music on if we could. Okay, now we have uh, the Trump judges. Neil Gorsuch actually brought some diversity to the court. Uh, like I mentioned before, he is now uh, Episcopalian, but also he was living in Denver. All the other judges and justices were usually living um, on the East Coast before. But then in other ways, if you look at his education and the fact that he was a Supreme Court law clerk, it's just more of the same. He came in really with the sense that he, he knew what he was doing. Um, that turned a lot of other justices off. If you just look at this opinion expert, he's being very arrogant. He's saying, you know, if you need to fix a statute, there's something called, it's called legislation. So he likes to talk down to his fellow justices. And as you can imagine, people that do that don't always win tons of friends and influence people. Um, and, and that's been the case since he joined. 
This is Brett Kavanaugh. I don't have a major opinion yet. I just have a quote from his confirmation hearing because that was one of the standouts. Um, but as we will get to later, Kavanaugh and Roberts might actually represent a moderate path. And if you want to talk about the future of Roe v. Wade, there is a world in which Kavanaugh and Roberts uphold Roe v. Wade joined by Breyer or Breyer's replacement, Kagan Sotomayor. This is Amy Coney Barrett. She's been on the court for such a short time that it's quite hard for me to say what her ideology is like. However, she was a Scalia clerk. She has written about constitutional law and the importance of precedent. So I can tell you what my hunches are, and it's a little bit too soon to know exactly what her ideology is. However, so far, she has been voting more like Scalia and Thomas than a moderate. Okay, some, some cartoons, right? The court is now 6-3 conservative. This is where, like I mentioned before, there are these ideological plottings. As you can see on the left side, Kennedy was the moderate and he was even slightly liberal versus conservative. As everyone here can see, the median, that middle justice has shifted. Kavanaugh was actually predicted to be closer to Thomas, but has ended up more, uh, more like Alito there in the, on the right side. Okay, this is, this is the same thing, which is just the flip of the media from the more liberal side to the conservative side. This will not be on the final, don't worry. Um, you can see it now. Kavanaugh, as the new median, is more conservative than Roberts. And here's another way to do it, which is when Ruthsburg was on the court, the median justice, John Roberts, was just ever so slightly right of center. Now, on the right side, if you count one, two, three, four, five, you can see that the fifth vote is more to the right. Okay? All right. This is the current term. Okay? And looks like this is perfect. I'm going to be able to wrap up right at 1240. Um, this is the current term. There are issues with religious liberty. That's a case called Fulton versus Philadelphia. The Affordable Care Act about whether the Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017 makes the Affordable Care Act basically inoperable. A voting rights case out of Arizona. Uh, a student speech right case where someone who didn't make the cheerleading team uh, posted something on Snapchat that represented free speech in some areas and vulgarity in others. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, which is basically about whether police need a warrant. And then juvenile punishment, that, that case actually already came down and we can talk about it. And these are big cases, but they're not as big in terms of culture war issues as cases that will be argued starting in October of 21. So number one, uh, Jahar Zarnayev's death penalty case is currently uh, expected to be argued. The, the Biden administration has to make some decisions about how, how, if and how it will defend it. This is about uh, jurors and the idea that there were some jurors on the case that were not forthright about their opinions and their ability to uh, vote for the death penalty fairly. The next case is going to be about Second Amendment rights, uh, conceal carry. Can you carry a gun outside the home? The, the two cases that the Supreme Court has spoken about gun rights, which are Heller and McDonald, have basically said you have a right to a handgun in your home for protection. They did not talk about how far that right goes outside of the home and what type of gun you can have. And then 
Just the other day, the Supreme Court granted certiorari, decided to hear a case about Mississippi's law that says you cannot have an abortion, you cannot terminate a pregnancy after 15 weeks, which seems to directly challenge existing Supreme Court law that says no abortion restrictions restrict abortion pre-viability, meaning the ability of the fetus to uh, survive outside the womb. So the Mississippi law seems to directly challenge existing Supreme Court precedent, and the fact that the court has granted this case suggests that it will probably in some part uphold the Mississippi law. The larger question, and we have 19 minutes of Q&A, the larger question is whether the Supreme Court will overturn the central Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade holding in its entirety. So we will leave it right there. Joe, how'd I do? Well, it sounds pretty good. Uh, I think some of these cases seem to me to not only address law, but get into the realm of philosophy. <laughs> Absolutely right. There is no legal answer to determine when life begins and to regulate the relationship between patients and doctors, just like there may no, not be a perfect legal answer whether colleges and universities like Northeastern can take race, gender, ethnicity, and religion into account with their admissions. I don't think you're going to get a precise legal answer. I think you're absolutely right. Professor Ehrman, thank you so much. Um, we're now gonna open the floor for Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, if you wanna put them into the chat, I will read them aloud and we will get started with this next portion. If people are shy, my, my own students and family members that I've, that I've paid to attend, I'm sure will ask some questions, so. And Alana, just before, I mean, I can say this as people start to write their questions. Um, what's, what's really interesting is that people think the Supreme Court is a kind of broken institution and people think that it's in need of reform. During the 2020 election, a lot of groups, especially on the left, so, so, so this, this is perfect, Alana, this is me answering the will Biden try to pack the court question. So David, thank you for, um, thank you for the question. So David says, will Biden try to pack the court? And like a good lawyer, I will say, well, what do you mean by that? Um, but let me just take, take the, the term pack to mean increase the personnel so that he can get justices with an ideology he likes. Does, I, I'm guessing that that's kind of what you mean, David. So can he, will he? Okay, number one. Well, Biden can't pack the court, but Congress can change the membership of the court as they please. And in fact, the, the membership of the court has changed lots of times. It's been six, it was actually 10 around the Civil War, and it's been nine since 1869. So the first point is all you need is a bill passed by Congress and signed by the president. If you recall during the debates, Biden would change the question or would try to avoid it every time. He said, I'm not real big into court packing. I'm not much of a court packer. Biden is an institutionalist. He's been in DC a long time. He does not want to pack the court or change its membership. He did what lots of DC politicians have been doing for decades. He formed a commission. And for those of you that want more Supreme Court 
uh, intellectual nourishment today, you can probably sign on to their first meeting this afternoon. The Supreme Court Commission involves 36 members, most of whom are law professors, that are going to give Biden recommendations. He didn't even really ask for specific reforms. He kind of asked for a book report. And my view is that the Supreme Court Commission that Biden asked for is a way for him to stall and hopefully put pressure on John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh and maybe Amy Coney Barrett. As people might recall, Franklin Delano Roosevelt tried to pack the Supreme Court in 1936, 1937. It failed. It was very unpopular, but ultimately the court began upholding his signature New Deal policies. So he may have lost that little battle, but he won the overall war. And in fact, the Supreme Court upheld every congressional law passed under the Commerce Clause from 1937 through 1995. So I think Biden in this commission forming might actually just be trying to put pressure on the court and say to the court, you better not be too far out of step with the American public. So that's that's kind of uh, my take. Okay, sorry, I'm a little ahead. Um, what's the future of Citizens United? Well, so Rich Evans, good, good question. So just a remark for everyone. Citizens United is a 2010 case where the Supreme Court said the First Amendment prohibits Congress from regulating independent expenditures by corporations and unions. In other words, in the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which is known as BICRA or McCain-Feingold, there were limits on what were called electioneering ads that uh, unions and corporations would pay, would pay for. And Citizens United basically said the First Amendment prohibits that. However, it can increase disclosure requirements. I don't think Citizens United is going to be overturned, even though about 80% of the public didn't like it. I think what might happen is there might be some increased transparency rules and more state by state regulation of campaign finance. The larger issue, though, is that at least six justices on the current court do think that the First Amendment invalidates all of these requirements. So it's a little bit of a circle where state, local, and federal legislatures can try to change the laws and then the court keeps invalidating them. So I guess what I'm saying is I think Citizens United is here to stay, Rich. How much of a realistic possibility are term limits? Ah, so that, yeah, so that's another uh, interesting question which will be explored by the Biden Supreme Court Commission. So federal judges, this is all in Article Three of the Constitution, which is which is not too long. Federal judges serve during good behavior, and it's got that British U in it. Uh, that basically means for life. So that our Constitution says that, that the justices or the federal judges serve for life as long as they are not impeached and removed. As we know, impeachment's not that hard. You know what's really hard? Removal. Okay. I think, I think uh, if anyone's been watching politics lately, you know that. So as you might recall, people thought Kavanaugh was going to be impeached and removed, but then people, people moved on because there was someone else to impeach. Uh, so term limits have that threshold constitutional question. Creative scholars have said the way around them is you have the right to be a judge, but not necessarily the right to be a Supreme Court justice. Okay, so, so bear with me for a second. In other words, you sit on the Supreme Court for 18 years, and then after you're just kind of a roving federal judge. 
So you actually have not lost your position as a judge, but you're not hearing cases on the Supreme Court. So that's one kind of workaround. But most of the Supreme Court reform proposals have suggested that there would be an 18 year term limit. To really make sure, you would have to amend the constitution. And as I think we know, that's only happened either 17 or 27 times. That's pretty long odds. And I don't think that there's the type of consensus that one would need to amend the constitution that way. Is there such a thing as a truly honest judge who is also impartial? Oh my gosh. I mean, this is, that's the question. I would say $64,000 question, but I think with inflation, it's higher. Uh, that's the real question. Is there such a thing as an impartial or honest judge? That's what I try to explore in my classes, which is, is there a neutral way of looking at anything? Most of the major approaches to interpreting the Constitution and interpreting statutes, written laws, are attempts to be consistent, impartial. Now, impartial can mean you're not, quote unquote, rooting for one party or the other, right? So impartial could mean you don't, you know, you're, you're, you're not favoring a group. And these theories are attempts by judges and justices to try to be as impartial as possible. The problem is there's no way to enforce consistent application of the theory. So all of the justices will selectively apply their theories, whether it's originalism, whether it's a living constitution, whether it's pragmatism. So um, I don't think there's a, a fully impartial person, but I think honesty is acknowledging that judging involves judgment and basically saying, this is my best effort to get it right. It's not perfect, but here's, you know, here's what I'm suggesting. Um, there's actually an ethics law that requires judges to recuse when there could be the appearance of a conflict. And for all judges, except for the Supreme Court, it's a binding law. Supreme Court justices decide on their own if they should recuse from a case. I think that's problematic. And I think there should be some type of ethics panel to make sure that's the case. But I think the answer is, um, you know, honesty and impartiality are sort of contested concepts. But what I do think is, a truly honest judge admits that these are very, very hard questions without clear answers. How do you think the court might rule with respect to eliminating the electoral college? You know, the the that's a that's another example um, of that probably requires a constitutional amendment. The one way around it that some of you might be familiar with is called the NPV which is the national popular vote, which is an interstate compact. NPV would basically say that enough states agree with one another that if the national election results, the popular vote favors one candidate, that they will then send their electoral votes in that direction to sure that the electoral college is a reflection of the national popular vote rather than the winner of each state. So do I think that would be challenged in court? Everything is challenged in court. So absolutely. Um, I don't know exactly how the cookie would crumble, as they say. Um, but I really think that if you were going to change how we choose our presidents, that that would have to be another constitutional amendment. And if you think that eliminating the filibuster is hard, or if you think that getting past the filibuster in the Senate is hard, try amending the Constitution, which requires a supermajority twice. Do you think the current Supreme Court justices see their credibility linked to the public opinion of their decisions? Great question. 
I think most, but not all of them do. Uh, Stephen Breyer gave a lecture a few weeks ago where he basically said, we depend on the public to implement and accept our decisions. Um, so on hot button issues, the court does rely on the public. Of course, courts sometimes have to stand up for minorities, numerical minorities. And if you look at their free speech jurisprudence, the court supporting groups that have, you know, five, 10 percent support in the polls. But in general, over the long term, the court needs the other branches and the public to implement its decisions. And if you look at major court rulings over time, they have tended to reflect shifts in elite opinion. So for marriage equality, it, the court waited until way over half of Americans were comfortable with same-sex marriage, right? They, they didn't do it in 2012, 2013, 2014. They waited until 2015. So on hot button issues, the court rarely strays too far. And it's a great question because here we are, um, let's, let's look at, at gun safety and let's look at abortion. With abortion, a majority of the country wants abortion to be safe, legal, and rare, okay? So they would like it to be, uh, you know, if it happens to be rare at a hospital and to not be illegal. With guns, they understand that people have the right to guns, but that sensible regulations are okay. The court next term could issue rulings that are out of step with those views. And then there's that larger question of whether it provokes a backlash. Roe v. Wade itself in 1973 sparked a tremendous backlash that we're still dealing with today. Trump's election, again, I would argue, was aided by backlash to Roe v. Wade. But the pendulum can, can uh, swing in both ways. So rulings that would be out of step next term could then spark a backlash in the other direction. I see we have about two minutes left. Sure. Um, if you want to address any of the remaining questions okay. or any closing thoughts you may have from your presentation. Okay. Um, one question from a, a Zoe Kleinfeld is about Congress ceding its legislative authority to, to courts. So, um, it's a great question, Zoe. I think that a lot of times Congress will pass vague laws in order to let the courts clean it up. I think that's very insightful. Um, when you mentioned jurisdiction stripping, which would be efforts by Congress to keep things out of the court. So let's just argue that Democrats control Congress and they see the courts as hostile. Uh, I, I could see them meeting a similar fate to jurisdiction stripping in the 90s, Zoe. The courts will strike down the laws that are limiting their power. I just went a little meta, but I think that you could absolutely see courts doing that. Um, the last question by Brian Doherty is, what is your opinion of the Federalist Society's influence? My opinion is that it is profound, that it is effective, that it helped Trump get elected. He didn't outsource to the Federalist Society, he insourced it. And you know what? There's nothing that says that progressives can't do the same thing on their side. However, there's a lot of infighting currently on the progressive side about the best judicial ideology and the best way to achieve justice through the courts. So my view is, uh, if you can't beat them, join them uh, or learn from them. And I think that the progressive left has a lot to learn from the Federalist Society in terms of message discipline uh, and networking across the country. Professor Ehrman, can you just remind the crowd how they can find your presentation if they want to access it? Sure. I will. So, so I will share the PowerPoints with you, Alana. And I think if everyone just maxes out their donations to the alumni club, I'll I'll deliver it in, by hand. No, I'm just kidding. I don't even get a commission. Um, but um, I, I will make it available to the alumni uh, to the alumni group, and then and or you can email me d dot at northeastern. It's safe to do so. 
uh, come say hi on campus. We have a new, uh, it's called Co-Oper or Cooper. There's a new, there's a new Husky. If you read, if, if you read news at Northeastern, there's a new animal that I guess is a service dog around campus. So we can go take it for a walk together uh, when it's safe to do so. Professor Ehrman, thank you so much for your time and thank you all for tuning in. Um, this was truly a treat. I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.